Turn around and shake hands. I almost said gather around the altar for prayer. <laughs> Turn around and shake hands with those. Make sure our visitors are welcomed in. Singing on the last. Souls in danger, look above. Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master. Billows his will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be, be saved today. Cause love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Nothing else could help love lifted. Sing it one more time. Cause love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Ask the ushers to come. Go ahead. Ushers to come for this morning's tithes and offerings. Singing this. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. What about it? Oh, how great thou art. How great. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. One more time. Then sings my soul. Is he great? Yes, he is. Oh, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. Amen. It's good to have Gene Edwards back with us. He was in the hospital. Jim Tolbert's back with us. He was in the hospital. 
Uh, let's remember Brother Wally. Wally had surgery and he's in the hospital. And, and Babs, Babs' brother passed away yesterday, so she's on her way up there. So let's remember uh, them in prayer. And Marzi Evans, yes, let's remember her as well. Brother Tom, would you pray for us? Bible Center, 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'm going to do it a little bit different here today. I hope that's all right. Maybe have some singing at the end. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We'll read a little bit later. I was thinking about entitling this message. Help me, Jesus, my daughter is turning 13 this week. <laughs> I've been preparing this message for some time, knowing that she was about to become a teenager. Seems like only yesterday we were bringing her home. How many remember that day waiting to bring that first... Baby home, Chuck Swindoll. Chuck Swindoll says, I remember the anticipation of bringing home this soft, cuddly, wonderful, delightful infant. Finally, the birth takes place and everything's fine. And a day or so later, you come home. And the first week, you realize that what you really have is a cross between Terminator and the Swamp Thing. <laughs> he 
said, I mean, this creature sleeps when you're awake and wide awake when you're asleep and has a set of lungs that could drown out a Concorde jet. He said, my wife used to say, honey, I'm sort of forgetting what our baby's face looks like. I'm spending so much time at the other end. But then they grow up and they become teenagers. James Dobson says about teenagers, that dynamic time of life which comes in with a pimple and goes out with a beard. (laughs) Mark Twain once gave the advice concerning raising teenagers. He said, when a child turns 12, he should be kept in a barrel and fed through a hole (laughs) until he reaches 16, at which time you should plug up the hole. That was Mark Twain's take on how to handle teens during their teenage years. But I want you to know, the teenage years can be some of the greatest years in a person's life. Many young people have done great and mighty things for God in their teenage years. Willie Johnson, he was just 11 years old when he earned the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. Louis Braille, at age 15, invented the Braille reading system. At age 13, Anne Frank began writing her diary, which I think every young lady and young man should read, which later published in 60 different languages. At the age of 19, John D. Rockefeller began his very first company. Also at age 19, Steve Jobs began collaborating with Steve Wozniak on what would later become Apple Computer. At age 19, Bill Gates co-founded Microsoft. And I I read all that and I just want to say, if these men and women at those ages can do great things in the world, why can't our young men and women at that age do great things for God? Amen? And sometimes we we look at teenagers as if we we got to just simply watch out for the bad things that they might want to do. But I, I want to challenge all parents today. Let's develop our young teenagers. Let's encourage our teenagers for the great things that God intends to do through them in their life. Amen. Young person, God intends for your life to be a vessel unto honor. For you to be a light that's used for the glory of God. So this morning, I just want to give some practical suggestions about the teenage years. Just things that I have been regretfully jotting down as the day so approaches, knowing that my oldest is about to become a teenager. Three practical suggestions, and we'll be finished. First of all, I want you to know there is great potential during the teenage years. There is great potential in your teen. Let me give you some areas where I see there can be great potential in these teen years. First, there's potential for great faith. Teenagers can trust God oftentimes much more readily than adults. They they haven't lived long enough to figure out what can't be done. They still believe God can do great and mighty things. I tell you what, if I was sick, I'd go down to the K-5 in first grade and ask those kids to pray for me because they believe God will do just what He says He will do. And teenagers, many times, they're they're the same way. And I hope you teenagers, you go out into this world and you'll recognize that our God can do anything but fail. Now as you read the story of David in the book of 1 Samuel, you'll find that he had developed great faith in the Lord during his latter childhood and early teen years. And it didn't take long for others to notice. Can I tell you that you can know when the Lord is upon a teenager? That you can know when the Holy Spirit moves upon the life of a teenager? Look in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 18. This is being said about a teenager. It says, Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person. Notice, and the Lord is with him. Young people, no greater thing can be said about you than that the Lord is with you. You can tell when the Lord is upon a child. There's something distinct about their spirit. There's something distinct about their walk and their character. In David's life, it was said that while he was a teenager, the Lord was with him. 
And I want you to notice this young godly man and notice his great faith in God. We see it in his speech. I want to set the scene for you. Here's little David, a shepherd boy, and he is now being brought in to stand before the king of Israel. Think he'd be a little timid? Maybe a little shy in what he might want to say? No, you know what he's doing? He brags on God. In chapter 17, if you'll look in verse 37, as he stands before Saul, who at that time was the giant of the Jews, head and shoulder above every Jew, David said in verse 37, Moreover, notice, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he might deliver me out of the hand of the Philistines. Is that what he says? No, he says, Saul, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistines. You move forward to verse 47. Now he's standing before Goliath, the giant of the Philistines. And he says, And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he might give you into my hand. No. He says he will give you into our hands. Do you hear the great faith coming from this teenager? And I want to remind our teenagers, that every victory in life and every defeat in life, all of it is to prepare you for the greater battles that are still to come in your life. And the way I see things coming in America, we're going to need teenagers who know more than just how to use texting, amen, and know more than just how to use Instagram and, and know more than just know how to, to play the Xbox. We're going to need teenagers who have a real intimate walk with God. And shows great faith in God like little David. And some may look upon you as just a youth. And some may look upon you as just a child. But when you have great faith in God, people will notice. And mighty things can happen. So there is great potential in the teen years. Let me give you a second thing. Not only great potential in the teen years, but listen, there are great pitfalls in the teen years. There are pitfalls, young person. There are sometimes vulnerabilities in young people's lives. We all know teenagers will go through temptations and, and seasons in their life where there will be pitfalls. Let me share a few of these pitfalls with you very quickly. First of all, there's a lack of a genuine relationship with God. Now listen, there is a danger that a child can go to church his whole life can go to Sunday school, can go to their youth group, even go to a Christian school and very mechanically hear the things of God, hear the preached word, be brought up in a Christian home, and never have a close relationship with Jesus Christ. Now listen, I'm not saying that they're not saved. I'm not speaking about that. I'm speaking about saved teenagers who are just going through the motions without ever feeling the closeness to their Lord and Savior. There is that pitfall where a teenager will go through with the religious rituals and they have the religious vocabulary and the, the religious dress, but they, they don't know how to listen to God as he tries to speak or, or feel the anointing presence of the Holy Spirit in a very intimate way. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, David, now a grown man, says to his teenage son, he says, and thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all the hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. And if thou seek him, he will be found. Teenagers, God wants you to have a real relationship with him. God wants you to seek after him to search after Him, and to walk after Him according to His holy word. Teenagers, that every time the doors of the church house is open, that you should be in attendance so that you can grow and that you can mature in your faith. You say, well, my parents don't faithfully come back. They're hit and miss. Parents, be real careful what you're teaching your children today. Because if you do it, if you make it a practice, they will do it. One writer said, It is my firm belief that approximately 85% of one's adult personality is formed by the time he is six years old. Therefore, these first six years are crucial. One educator said, Give me a child until he is six and he will belong to me for life. 
Barna Research Group showed that if a person does not accept Jesus Christ as Savior before the age of 12, the likelihood of ever doing so is very slim. Parents, it is our job to faithfully bring them to the house of the Lord. And teenager, if your mom and dad won't come back to church on Sunday night or Wednesday night, call your pastor, I'll come pick you up for church. I would love to personally come to your house, knock on your door, and your parents answer it, and I say, please get Junior or Sissy to come out. I'm taking them to church where they belong. We need to be in church more than ever. We need to be with our children and our families in church more than ever. Sunday is not your family day, and Wednesday night is not Little League Baseball Day. We are to be in church every Sunday, every Wednesday. Be in the house of God. Well, I'm tired. Everybody's tired. Well, I've got to work the next day. Be thankful you got a job and come to church and tell Jesus how thankful you are. you got a job to go to the next day. We need to be in church. I get letters periodically from people saying, well... God's been so good to me, or or God did something for me in a special way, and now you can count on me to be in church Sunday night and Wednesday night. You know why I say I'll give you eight weeks. If it takes something God's already done for you to get you in church, folks, let me tell you something. Don't wait for God to have to do something for you to go to church. He's already done something for you to go to church. He died for you on Calvary. Young people... Be faithful. Parents, your teenagers watching you. Show them, mom and dad, what it means to be a faithful Christian. Teenagers, serve God with a perfect heart. Seek God with a humble spirit. Listen for Him to speak to you through His Holy Spirit. So a lack of real close relationship with God is a a terrible pitfall. Notice, secondly, a, a lack of clear boundaries in their life is a terrible pitfall. See, God is clear. God is definitive in the scriptures that he wants parents of teenagers to give boundaries. And yes, teenagers need boundaries. Even though they may push them, even though they may act like they don't want them, it is the responsibility of the parent to set the boundaries. Proverbs 4 verse 1 says, Here... Ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. Now that word doctrine simply means a set of beliefs. And sometimes a teenager will push against the schedule. And sometimes teenagers will will push against the set of beliefs. You tell your boy to cut their hair a certain way and... He goes out and he wants to do how he wants to do it. You'll tell your daughter to wear a dress that you would feel more modest. And she will push against it and try to get you to to budge just a little bit. But mom and dad set the boundaries. Mom and dad keep the boundaries. And make sure you're honoring the Lord in all the boundaries you set while raising your children. Larry Burkett, he told the story about a kindergarten in one town that sat right on the corner of a busy highway. And although the school had a nice yard in which children could play at recess, they would all instead huddle right up against the building. They wouldn't go out in the yard. The cars were whizzing by, back and forth. It was frightening all the children. So one day, the principal had an idea. He set up a plastic fence and put it up around the entire schoolyard. He said the cars were still whizzing by, The children could see these cars flying by. But the principal said from that point on, when the fence went up, the children began using the entire playground. He said the fence did not limit their freedom. It actually expanded their freedom. And I tell you this morning, all children, whether in kindergarten or teenagers, they need fences in their life. And whether they know it or not, they feel more secure having discipline of clear boundaries. And parents, if your kids are living in your house and eating your food, you set the boundaries. You set the rules. And young person, I hope you realize that your parents are not the roadblock to your roller coaster of a fun life. 
Instead, I hope you would realize and recognize as a teenager that your parents are there to provide for you and to protect you and to set biblical boundaries for you. Tony Evans said this. He said, the mark of an authentic parent is that they are not out to please the child. They are out to do what's best for the child. But if a parent pleases their child all the time, the child then becomes the parent. Teenagers, boundaries are not made to limit your fun. Boundaries are made to provide protection in your life. So there is potential in the teenage years. And there is pitfalls in the teenage years. Let me give you a third thing. There's also privileges in the teenage years. Amen? See, the teen years are years when young people begin to experience certain privileges they have not experienced up till that time in their life. And there are several of these that, that we could mention, but for time's sake, I'll just, I'll just name just a few. But one of the privileges you as a teenager will experience is the making of money, is getting a job. And parents, I say to you, first of all, teach your children the importance of tithing to their church. Amen. Notice I said, parents, teach your children. What's the best way to teach your children? By doing it yourself. Let them learn from experience. You teach them that for every 10, 20, 30, 40 dollars they make, there is an amount that needs to be given back to the Lord. It's your responsibility, parent, to teach the principle of tithing to your children, and this lesson should be learned well before they go off to college. Young people, watch your money. Be responsible with your money. Be careful who you give your money to. Someone said every time you lend money to a friend, you damage his memory. <laughs> Be careful. With money. We're talking about privileges of the teenager. The teenage years are years of making money. Let me give you another privilege. The teenage years are years for personal responsibility. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 11, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I what put away childish things. Young people today are taking longer and longer to grow up. Now I do thank the Lord for those who are here and they're teenagers and they lead and they're maturing in a godly fashion and they have a purpose and they have a direction for their life. But when you see some teenagers and some young adults, you wonder how long till they get it? How long till they grow up? George Barna again said this, we are seeing more and more of the millennial generation living at home well into their mid to upper 30s in the United States of America. Why is that? Because young people are not being taught how to get a job. Amen. How to handle their money. Yes. How to do things without mom and dad always bailing them out every single time. The teenage years are years for personal responsibility. By the way, that includes the friends you hang out with. Parents, sure, let them spend time with their friends. But parents, make sure you approve of their friends first. The places they go must meet your approval. Let there be a curfew. Let there be time restraints. Remember, we're, we're setting up boundaries here. Hey, here's an idea. Let them do chores around the house in order to have other privileges. See, the older folks are clapping. In other words, determine ways your child can earn privileges and rights. Not giving them the attitude that everything is just expected in their life, but that things are earned. I love what Howard Hendricks said. Listen to this quote. He said, teens need expanding freedom, but only when they demonstrate expanding responsibility. So many teenagers today, they, they skip their homework and they skip their chores and they play computer games and they spend time on the internet, all their phone, all of this unbridled time, and, and then they just want more and more and more. And I'm simply saying, you do not, as a parent, reward a lack of responsibility. 
Make sure there's personal responsibility developing in their life. And then thirdly, here's another privilege. The teenage years are years for relational development. They are now beginning to make friendships. They are now beginning to spend time more and more with with some of their closer friends or what they would call best friends. And when you think about the relational influences on your children, let let me give you a couple thoughts. First, parents, you want your child to have pure influences on their life. Now, I did not say perfect. Nobody's perfect except sweet little Emery who's out in children's church right now. But everybody else, I I don't mean perfect. But I speak here of a a purity in the sense of a, a moral purity. A, a, a moral innocence. Young people who are, who are going to be good sharpening influences on your life. Henry Ford said this. He said, my best friend is the one who brings out the best in me. Parents, you want to help your children find that person. Teenagers, do you have friends that bring out the best in you? Are you the kind of friend that brings out the best in others? Romans chapter 14 verse 13 says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Make sure that your child is developing relationally with people that have the same biblical standards and the same biblical principles that you have along the way. Now they may befriend someone who's a a new Christian. That's great. They may befriend someone who says they're a Christian. And that's great. Until that friend starts to influence your child in a negative way. And parents, when that happens, you need to step in. Someone said, your children will become like the friends they keep, the books they read, and the shows they watch on television. And a parent must guard the relational development of their children in that way. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 17 says this, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. So teenagers, those of you who choose godly friends, it will encourage you in the faith. It will strengthen you in the faith. But if you choose friends who are not faithful to the Lord, that are always negative in spirit, ultimately it will have an effect on your life. Our prayer is you surround yourself with friends of character, friends of integrity, friends of honesty and godly morals. Parents, don't be afraid to talk with your teenager about their friends. Don't be afraid to talk with your teenager about the influence of their friends. And this is just me, but listen, just because they turn 16 or 17 doesn't mean they can go wherever or whenever. You ought to know where they are at. You ought to know who else is in the house with them. You ought to never have a teenager at another teenager's house where there's no parental authority. You say, well, you don't trust your teenager? No, listen, it's my God-given responsibility to provide protection for my child. So there are privileges of the teenager. There are financial privileges. There are social privileges. There are relational privileges. But those privileges, while they expand with age as teenagers, are still bounded by the authority of the parents in their life. So we see there's a potential, and there's pitfalls, and there's privileges. And I was going to stop there, and the teenager's saying, I wish you would. <laughs> there's one more i got to talk about. Since my daughter will become a teenager in five days, I just added this one. Potential of the teenager, pitfall of the teenager, privilege of the teenager, and preparation for dating in the teenage years. So, Cadence, listen up. <laughs> this is just me. This is just me. But I don't really push for young people to be dating in their early teen years. I'm not an advocate. For serious dating in those years. I'll be honest with you, even when they get into their high school year, I'm not a big fan of serious dating. You know what? I went on my first date my second semester of my senior year in high school. 
my first date. And somebody, you missed out on a lot. Yeah, I missed out a lot on spending a bunch of money on someone I didn't even care about. <laughs> Sometimes we, we see these early teens and they just completely get head over heels with each other. They're hanging all over each other like they're married. Disgusting. They go on these teen outings together and they just sit and stare at each other and drool. And it's almost as if they've missed their entire youth experience. I really believe the idea of serious dating is in preparation ultimately and potentially for marriage. And a 13, 14, 15 year old, they're not ready for that process. I'm not saying boys don't like girls and and girls don't like boys and they don't become interested more and more. But I don't think they need to be committing their lives together. I don't think you ought to be saying I love you to 18 other guys before you find the one you're going to marry. It's a father and a grandfather over there. It's laughing. But people are dating younger and younger. Paul Harvey told the true story about a nine-year-old boy who announced to his parents that day he had a date. He said, I have a date with another girl in my class at the age of nine. His parents were taken back. But the lad had already called the girl on the phone and invited her over for lunch and a movie. At first, the parents thought this was a joke until the doorbell rang. And there, sure enough, was this little girl standing next to her mother. The mother thought that this, this little girl, that thought it was the cutest thing, said, I'll pick you up in a couple hours, have fun on your date. So the little girl came in, and they sat down in the living room. The boy yelled out to his mom, Mom, two orders of mac and cheese. <laughs> the little girl had brought the VCR tape of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So surely enough, this was going to be a date with a dinner and a movie. The mother made the mac and cheese. The kids ate it, finished the movie. Little girl's mom came back to pick her up, and when they left, the father and mother sat across from each other just bewildered at what just happened. They could not believe their nine-year-old just had his first date with another nine-year-old. As their little boy walked back into the room and saw the bewildered look on his parents' face, he Walked over to his father, put his hand on his shoulder and said, Don't worry, Dad, nothing happened. (laughs) So I close with three applications. Two parents. Two parents. Concerning their children dating. Number one, parents, stay involved in your child's life. Bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Nurture them along this process. Admonish them along this process. And please, please make this determination in your house. If your child, your boy or your girl, likes another boy or girl in this church, and one of them breaks it off and doesn't like them anymore, don't allow it to affect your relationship with the other family in the church. Don't you stoop to the same silly emotional standard of the children. If you have a child that likes another child in the church and all of a sudden they don't like each other, don't take it personal with the other parents. It's real quiet in here right now, but I'm loving every minute of it. (laughs) We've had parents leave this church because those parents who left were just as childish as their teenagers. Parents, stay involved. Don't become the teenager. Be the parent. And I believe that a daughter is under her father's authority till she's married. I really believe that. And I believe a father should have a peace about the matter of a friendship with another boy. Parents, you should have a peace about the person your son or daughter is involved in. And when they start dating, and ultimately when it's time for marriage, there needs to be the approval of the father. 
I don't even want to think about my daughters getting married right now. I think one of the meanest things these girls do today is when their father has to walk right down this aisle and give the bride away. I mean, they bring the fathers right there in front of everybody. And then I have to release them to Bozo on the other side. You believe that? Some of you fathers shaking your head, you had to do it. Listen, I do, I do not believe that any young lady should think about marrying a young man unless she has her daddy's approval. You say, well, that's old-fashioned. Thank you, thank you. Welcome to my country. Welcome to my world. Parents are smiling. Teenagers are ticked off at me. I don't care. I believe it's biblical. So when I say parents stay involved, I'm talking about really involved. And young people, give your parents that place. They love you more than anybody else. We're talking about dating. Parents, stay involved. Parents, set the ground rules. Let your child know the ground rules of dating. You come up with them. Let them be biblical. Parents, let your child know that they should never date an unsaved person. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, Be not unequally yoked together. How can a person saved and a person who's unsaved, how can they glorify God in their marriage? Meet someone of like faith. The closer they are to your doctrinal persuasion, the better it is for your marriage. So set ground rules. Where they can go, where they can't go. When they need to be back. Young man, you want my daughter to come out? Don't honk your horn. She's not coming. You come to the door and knock. You ask her if she can go, and I might let her go. Might let her go. But stay involved. Set the ground rules. Number three, most importantly, talk to your children about purity. Talk to your children about purity. There's so much garbage on television. There's so much garbage in the magazines. There's so much garbage in music. Saying all kinds of different things from all different directions. Talk to them about purity. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 says, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. 2 Timothy chapter 2, flee youthful lusts. Let's be honest, during the teenage years, this is a challenge. Parents, don't leave this up to the youth pastor. It's not his responsibility, it's yours. You talk about staying pure and talk to your children. Say, well, once they get engaged, once she gets a ring, eh, they're almost a, the less physical contact before marriage, the better chance they have of remaining pure until marriage. So talk to your children about purity. Set the ground rules. Stay involved. My daughter's turning 13. Come up here, Cadence. I want her to know that me and her mom are so proud of her. Amen. And I'm so thankful that God gave her to us. Yes. And you've turned into a beautiful young lady. And God's using you. Amen. And as your father, I want the very best for her. Absolutely. And one day I'll have to give her away to another man. And I will hate him for months. <laughs> but I want him to love God with all his heart. Because if he loves God with all his heart, he'll love her with all his heart. So Cadence, I want you to trust me and your mom to approve of any young man who wants to date and marry you. And I promise that will give you our full blessing when God shows us the right one. Amen. Amen. I love you. Go sit down. Yeah. Parents, can we do that? Yeah. What just happened there, can we do that? Yeah. Your kids need to hear it. Yeah. They need to hear 
how proud you are of them. They need to hear how much you love them. They need to hear how much you're praying for them. And I know they do wrong things. But let's not harp on all the bad things they do. Let's tell them we love them. Let's lift them up before the throne of God. And let them know we're praying for them every single day. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We get a song of invitation. Again, these were suggestions that I brought up. I believe biblical. I'm not going to raise your child. I wouldn't try. But I think the least we can do, the least we can do, is every single day lift them up in prayer. I wonder how many parents with their child we hear have this morning. Why don't you come forward and we'll pray for you today. Come on down. Moms and dads, children, come on down. We do this periodically. I don't think we do it enough. Mm. We surround our kids with prayer. Yes. Moms and dad, get your kids. Come on down. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Mm. <laughs> don't you want the best for your kids? Absolutely. Grandparents, you want to come down? Yes, come on down yes, too. You're yes, just as yes. much part of their lives. Yes, sir. God bless you. We pray for purity. We pray for direction. <laughs> we pray for the Amen. spouse that God's preparing them for right yes, now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we lift them up to God. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That will raise them in the nurture and admonition Amen. of the Father. And that kids, we're not against you. We love you, and we want what's best for Amen. you. Amen. Amen. We'll wait. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. <laughs> yes, come on sir. up here. You can come all the way to the front. <laughs> God bless them. Yes, sir. -y. Yes, sir. -y. Oh, yeah. Yes. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. Father, thank you, Lord, for the message. Thank you, God, uh, our most uh, precious possessions. But we're kneeling beside today. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Amen. And Lord, I just pray, God, that you would give us the wisdom. Lord, give us the, the strength, the discernment, the determination. Lord, as Will mentioned, when times that we need to discipline, give us wisdom to do that. And when there's times to show mercy, God, show us when to do that. I pray for each home that's represented, Lord, that you'd put a hedge of protection around them. Lord, I thought as uh, we've heard all of our lives to build battlements around our home. Yes. In a world that's uh, trying to tear even Christians more and more away from the church, God, may we be more faithful, raise them for your honor and glory. And Lord, we don't realize the potential that they have for what they're going to do for you. But we confess to you as parents that we can't do it by ourselves. So we do ask for your help, God. We do ask you to set aside for every young person kneeling here. God bless them. Yes. A Christian young man or young woman of like faith. God, that would be their mate. That you would bind that marriage in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, we thank you, Lord, for a church, God, that allows us, God, to, to raise him for your glory. We love you and we thank you for this time. Lord, as we'll mention, thank you for our young people. God, thank you for the joy they bring to our hearts. And God, thank you for the wonderful, wonderful memories you've given us. And God, for the, the days ahead and the future. So we pray you bless the remainder of this altered service. We ask and pray in Jesus' name. Would you stand as we sing? If others still need to come, the altars are open. The things that I love.
and hold dear to my heart are just borrowed. They're not mine at all. Jesus, only let me use them to brighten my life. So remind me, remind me, dear That's over. God bless you. She thinks Amen. that was rough. Wait till she's 16. The message I got prepared for that one.